20 to 2 on Thursday the 2nd of December and I'm off on my first ever hot tent camp. I'm speaking to you from this lovely little recreation area in the really nice village of Stoke St Michael nestled away in East Mendip and East Mendip is my destination for tonight. I'm revisiting the highest point on the Fosway. Those of you who follow me will know that I rode the entire Fosway back in June from Exeter up to Lincoln following it as closely as possible. My world camp tonight is going to be at Beacon Hill Woods. I believe that's the highest point on the Fosway. My Garmin profile data suggested it's 938 feet in elevation, although some information I got from a local walk suggests it's only 720, so, so you can make your own mind that there's a, quite a huge discrepancy. Anyway, it's about two miles up there. The reason I've stopped here, first of all, it's a lovely village and I've just had some lunch here. There's also a Londis store just over the road and I researched this before I came. I've just stocked up the water there and because this is my first ever time uh, using a stove in a tent, a brand new stove in a brand new tent, I've actually taken the easy option. I've bought some processed wood from there. I've also got a saw and I was going to pick some dead wood, some fallen wood from the woods. I may still do that as well but the priority is just to give it a test tonight and debug it and just sort of see what works and what doesn't. It's going to be a quite a huge learning curve. I'm going to do a big direction change here and head up to the Fosway. I'll speak to you there because I think the location itself is really interesting as well. Anyway, two miles up that way. I'll see you there. Okay, we're very close to our destination. I've just ridden up on this minor road from Stoke St Michael up to the highest point of today's ride. It's actually a very gradual climb this. This is the Wagon and Horses pub for anybody who's familiar with the area. If I was to go straight across, I'd drop down towards Chateau Mallet. You may see some brilliant views in the distance. In fact, it's a lovely December day. It's been mostly clear blue sky all day, although there's some cloud building up now. But this road here, I'm going to join it actually, turn right. This is an old Roman road. This Roman road is designated as 45B. So let me just briefly explain that. In the 1950s, an historian, called Ivan Magri, I think. If I got that wrong, I'll put it on screen now. He catalogued all what he believed to be Roman roads and came up with a numbering and a reference system, which is widely used today by historians and archeologists. So this is 45B. So it joined Old Sarum, which is miles that way. That's near Salisbury to Charterhouse a few miles that way up on the Mendips, that's near Cheddar. There were lead and silver mines there and our destination is where the Fosway reaches its highest point, crosses this road at right angles as you can imagine because the Romans did everything dead straight. And then the Frostway would drop back down that way. So that's where we're heading for. I'm going to reference all my sources as well because a lot of this I'm using other people's material. Anyway, turn right here, 0 0.9 miles. 2.30 and I've reached my destination. This is the road I've just ridden about a mile along from the wagon and horses. And this is the intersection. That's the Frostway coming up from Oak Hill. And it would have crossed the 45B here before it goes through Beacon Hill Woods and then drops steeply down to the outskirts of Shepton Mallet and Canard's Grave. And so, X marks the spot. I did see a little entrance in there with a very defined footpath and it looked like plenty of good places to camp but I want to stay away from the road just in case I get any unwanted attention up here tonight. I'm going to avoid this as well because I'm going to repeat what I did back in the summer. I'm going to go along there and just through a, a gate there where a lot of people park to walk their dogs. And I'm going to try and replicate a little bit of film I did back in the summer. So here it goes.
just a few hundred yards into the wood and it's absolutely stunning here and I wasn't expecting this I, I missed this completely back in the summer but right on the edge there there's like a little picnic rest area you can see the Masbury transmitter there there's a couple of small farm wind turbines so the Fosway just came straight up here and the modern A37 is just over there about a quarter of a mile I can just make out a few vehicles going by about halfway to the far horizon and that's where the, the modern version of the Fosway the A37 climbs out of Shepton Mallet that's pretty steep in itself but they've softened the gradient by by curving it around the hill there's quite an overpowering noise here actually of the traffic I'm pretty sure that'll die down after dark okay I think I found my spot I've moved about 100 yards away from that picnic bench I can see people head there for the view there's a guy there bird watching with binoculars but there's also some signage up asking you to stay away from a bronze line there I think it must be a burial mound so I mean I love the countryside heritage and culture I don't want to risk damage it in any way whatsoever so I've moved here I think this is quite a good spot I've still got some good views the sun will be going down there I and mean, hopefully rising there in the morning what an amazing location as you can see it's all golden brown and everything's looking all green on the trees it just oh autumn this year has been fantastic I guess people are going to want to know about the stove and the tent so I'll show you a little bit about how I bought it up and then I'll try and show you me setting it up. The questions I've had so far is how do I propose to carry it? So the stove folds up very small. Most of it's titanium, two of the accessories are, are stainless steel, obviously a bit heavier. I've only bought one of those, I'll explain all that later on. It folds up into its own bag which I would say is about laptop size. but. A bit like my chair bag it allows so much more to get in there it just seems crazy not to utilize the space and also I was a bit concerned about the stove rattling a little bit although there's some straps in there to hold it all in place so I've just padded it out with the ground sheets and gloves uh, a carbon monoxide detector I'll show you when I open it all up the tent I've done what I have been doing recently, I've just taken the pegs out and the pole out and I've put it in the canvas bag that the seat comes in, there's plenty of room in there, again why not utilise it. The tent is only single skin, it's wigwam formation and I hope to be able to sit in there on a seat with a table with my stove rather than doing all my cooking outside and staying outside as long as possible, it's all going to be inside, that's what I'm hoping anyway. They do recommend with the stove, you burn it in the first time at home. The reason being is because it's titanium, the flue, the chimney in effect, is comes in rolled form. It's almost like uh, trying to roll a razor blade. And the first time you do it, they really do recommend two people do it. Although I've seen other people doing it solo. Me and my wife did it on Sunday. It went fine. Again, I'll talk through that later on. So it has had its first burn in and the stoves had a 30 minute burn and it's warped very slightly but it all goes back together again and it started to take that really nice rainbowy colour of purple, blue and gold. I hope it goes without saying I'd never damage the woods in any way whatsoever so I'm just looking for fallen wood and also that's going to burn much easier anyway there's plenty of it about look just just wandering around here you can pick bits up I've got my saw a lot of it I can break by foot so that's what I'm going to be doing for the next 20 minutes or so just making the wood pile up ready for tonight I would say about camping in woods 
it can be quite frightening after dark. It all comes to life after dark uh, with animals, nocturnal animals. The first time I ever camped in a wood was in the former Yugoslavia when it's behind the Iron Curtain. And luckily there was a few of us, so, you know, we eased each other's nerves, but it was a bit spooky the first time. The other thing I'd say about camping in woods, my own experience is it's very easy to get lost at night, so I really don't want to wander too far from the tent. The new tent is single skin, so I've got this really heavy duty ground sheet to put inside but it also allows me to start organizing everything else here so here's the the wood burner it's a woods walker titanium stove that's about the size of a laptop bag obviously a little bit higher more depth and here it is as you see it all packs in quite nicely that's the flue rolled up I'll show you how that goes together and there's a strap holding that's the main body plus the lid of it that's the stainless steel accessory I was telling you about the cage and that's a damper in there that just helps control the airflow. This is what I padded that bag out with so there's all my gloves for constructing the flue, uh, gathering the wood, probably tending the fire as well. Just to keep things simple tonight because it's all new I bought some MREs their meals ready to eat. They're army surplus ration packs. So I've got two chicken and vegetable curries with rice. And then I've got an all day breakfast for tomorrow morning. So again, it, it's just keeping things simple. I got my billy can to boil some water. And because I got the billy can, there's also my meth stove in there that I bought for the Fosway as a backup, just in case things didn't go to plan tonight. Next up, I'm gonna get the tent out. I'm going to lay it about there. I've just used a big stick of wood to try and get rid of as many leaves as possible. I'm not sure if ticks are a problem this time of the year, but obviously I don't want to go putting the tent on a big pile of leaves. Here's the chair bag then, the FE Active chair. As you can see, I've padded it out with lots of other stuff. It's got the tent pegs and the tent pole in there. And that's a stove jack. Again, I'll, I'll explain that as I put the tent and the stove together. You may have seen from the video just below this, I did go up to a local recreation field yesterday, day before yesterday, and just quickly erected the tent just to make sure I knew what I was doing. So it's got a central pole. The only thing I don't like about it is it's got these very sharp tent pegs. I'm probably going to go into town next week and get some just rounded, softer ones. I'm not quite sure what those cords are for. I mean, they just get in the way, to be honest. So I'll probably replace those actually during the week, but this is pretty substantial. And the tent itself, as I've started doing with the Van Gogh Banshee, I just shove it, compress it into a stuff sack, so that's actually compressed much smaller than my summer sleeping bag. The tent is octagonal shape for the footprint, and then obviously uh, pointed for the TP apex. But how you erect it is, there's two doors, a front and a rear. So I've got the front door. Hopefully I'm going to look out to that sunset tonight. Then in the morning, if there's a sunrise, the light will be over there. So you peg out the two doors, they're 180 degrees apart. And then around the edges, there's three straps. So you just go for the middle one. So you've, that way you've got north, south, east and west. And then you put the pole in. There's the main body form then. I would say, because this is only my second time putting it up, I'm still learning how it goes up best. But I would say, do the four initial points quite loosely, because as I've gone around to do the additional ones to make it into an octagon, I've had to move the original ones, if that makes sense. So once the pole's up, it really gives it structure and integrity, and then you can sort of get a better idea of what you're trying to build. So there's the front door. That's where the stove jack is going to come out of. And it's got some guidelines to just torten it a bit. That's the inside then. The ground sheet will be going that side and the wood burner and the wood there. Above both entrances you've got these ventilation vents. The usual sort of thing. You get a stiffened piece of nylon with Velcro on. Plenty of airflow at the front and at the back. And here's where the stove's going to go, come out the tree. So as you can see, that just rolls back and you secure it there, well away from the pipe. That's the aperture open then, with the 
flap rolled back, the weatherproof storm flap, and you can see it's revealed its own Velcro square, and that's where you attach the stove jack to. That's basically just a heat resistant, almost like a soldering pad or an oven glove type bit of material with Velcro on the back. So that's just going to correspond to that square. I cut the hole out at home that will allow this stove pipe to come up through and project up there. There you have it then, the stove jack Velcroed into place. Next, I'll set the tripod up over there and show you me assembling the stove. And that's it, assembled. It's got a front door with a window in. There's an air vent to control airflow. It's got a side window for your ambiance. That's going to be nice tonight. And there's where the flue's going to come from. So the next part is rolling the pipe. That's what I've got the gloves for. This is the titanium flue. This is the part you really do need the gloves for, I would say so. There's the pipe folding into shape, as you can see, it's got a very sharp edge there and you have to slide these thin rings on. So this side, the side that was heated by the burner itself last week, just memorised its shape straight away. It just almost rolled into that shape. The other end, not quite as easy by myself. So that's the end I'm going to put in the stove today. So hopefully on its third burn, both ends should be much easier to form into the pipe. So now it's a case of putting it through the stove jack, marrying it up with the stove and then pegging it out. Well everything's up, I haven't quite lit the stove yet, but wow what location, look at this golden gingery brown carpet, these lovely trees and that's looking down towards Shepton Mallet and the Mendips beyond. Looks like it's going to be a pretty amazing sunset. I'm glad it's got two doors so I've chosen the the door to get in and out of tonight that way. Hopefully you might get a little bit of light or sunrise tomorrow morning that way. Wow I'm really looking forward to getting in there and getting things organised now. As I said earlier on, this is all new to me, so this isn't advice, it's just what I'm going to follow by reading other people's recommendations. So first of all, the recommendation is don't hermetically seal yourself in. You won't need to for one thing, but also the stove needs to breathe. I mean, fire needs oxygen, heat and fuel, doesn't it? So I've got my heavy-duty canvas ground sheet down. I've also got my German Army ground sheet as well. I'd probably just pull the tent down that end to try and get it closer to the ground but this side I'm definitely going to leave open as I said there's plenty of ventilation I'm not sure how well that's coming out but that is a lovely sunset those clouds are so orangey seems to emphasize the golden carpet of leaf <laughs> Oh wow this is amazing I, you can see I've got a light up in the top of my tent I'm just about to light the fire. There's a few families actually, sort of walking dogs, children with parents and all that. You can hear the constant roar of the A37 over there. Oh, you can see all the lights going up the hill as well now. I bought fire preparation kit from home. So I've got my cotton wool, they're like makeup wipes. Really cheap, they ignite very easily. Put them on that little platform there got these wood chip thingies um, that's like just leftover sweepings from woodwork sh workshop floors and all the wax and sawdust and everything compressed in there they're really good for getting the fire going I've also got my trusty fire steel which I haven't used for a few years actually let's give this a go first time all right let's get that in there
that's going quite nicely already I'll let it just take a little bit so on the front you've got this air vent and on the back of the flue you've also got a damper it's just a little thin plate I'll show you that later on actually just helps control the airflow this is all new to me and I'm told each different stove has its own characteristics so it's just, just a case of sucking it and see really what works best what doesn't what causes smoke what doesn't that sort of thing that's the wood burning away nicely and that's a little cage four-sided cage it just packs flat and then it's hinged and it just forms that tower cage um, as I said you can dry wood in it that's what I'm actually doing at the moment as an experiment you can even put stones in there heat them up and then sprinkle water it on it and create your own sauna this is all new to me so I'm learning as I go along and clearly opinions vary on carbon monoxide some people say you need to be very aware of it other people say that's just a myth as long as you manage your fire properly well I don't know what's proper and what's not at the moment it's going to be trial and error so I've hedged my bets I've bought a CO alarm we've got at home carbon monoxide alarm from home we keep this right by our boiler actually so just if there is an issue that should go off tonight but the, at the moment I've got the door open gosh I can feel the heat coming off it already it's right what they say that pumps out some heat that's the front door that's the side door oh wow look at that that's going to be nice wow this is super cozy and i'll tell you what it's right what everybody says i can feel the heat already i'm getting really warm in here that's with the door wide open look at that amazing sunset it's not even five o'clock yet i think it's about a quarter to five there's the flu going up through the jack so warm in that tent look at that lovely sunset It's December, I'm a thousand feet up, there was ice on the roads this morning, there's frost due tomorrow. I'm in a t-shirt, I've just had to open the door because it's so warm in here. It's quarter to one in the morning and I got woken up by some rustling on my tent. I wondered what the rustling was and it's this fall, falling, off the, falling off the side of the tent.